If you've ever tried to build a small device that connects to a computer with a USB port, chances are you've run across one of these. This is an FTDI USB to serial converter, and it's one of the most common methods people use to connect their devices to a computer. And there's a good reason for it. They're really simple on the hardware side. They have several pins, some of which are transmit and receive for serial data, and they're amazingly simple on the software side. When you plug this into a USB port of a modern computer, it just works. You don't have to install any special software. If the software isn't already supported by the operating system, Windows, for example, will go to the internet, download the drivers, and just pop up a little notification to let you know that your device is ready to use. Because the setup is so simple, I love including these in my own projects. As a scientist, I noticed that a lot of laboratory equipment, although it's really big and expensive and complicated, ultimately just uses an FTDI chip to provide USB connectivity, a chip just like this one. So I became really interested in these chips, but recently I started exploring what we can do with these chips beyond sending simple serial data. In this video, we're going to explore how to take control over the individual pin states of output pins on these FTDI chips. We're going to use the C-sharp programming language and bitbang SPI data to control SPI devices directly from an FTDI chip. So we'll have a computer with a USB cable controlling an FTDI chip directly controlling SPI devices. No need for a serial protocol and no need for a microcontroller. So let's get started. To get started here, I'm going to plug in an FTDI device. I just plugged in an FT232R and we can check out the device by using FTProg. Now this is a helpful application that you can get from the FTDI website and it'll just scan your system for all plugged in FTDI devices. Right now I've just got one, that FT232R, and I can actually plug in a second here. And now that it's plugged in, I'll hit the scan button. And now we find two devices. One of them is a 232H, the other is 232R. This will help us later if we want to select a specific device by its device number. They start at zero and they increase depending on how many devices you got plugged in. But I'm gonna keep it simple and only leave one plugged in my computer. And I just unplugged one of them. So now we're down to the 232R, device zero. Let's practice interacting with the device using code. So I'm gonna open Visual Studio. And if you're not a Visual Studio programmer or you aren't familiar with C-sharp.net, the language I'm gonna be using today, don't worry about it. Um, the code examples I'm going to be showing are so simple that I think anyone can follow along. So I'm gonna start by creating a new project and let's save it in a temporary folder, video demo. And let's call it FTDI video demo. And I'm gonna make it a console application. I could make it a Windows form application so we could have a little GUI with an X button and all that and buttons you can click to do things, but I think this will be easy enough, a console application. So the first thing I'm gonna do is install the library that I need to allow me to interact with FTDI devices. I can do that with NuGet. So I right click and go to manage NuGet packages. Um, if you're familiar with Python, NuGet is kind of like pip, where it lets you easily install libraries maintained by other authors. So I'll just search for FTDI, there it is, and hit install. And as soon as that finishes, that means that I can just immediately start using the library. So using FTD, there we go. Now I can start to instantiate FTDV, FTDI objects and interact with them. So public, static, FTDI, new FTDI. This is the object that we're gonna be interacting with to open a device, close a device, and send data to it. Every time we interact with this object, it returns a code, like a message code, to let us know if the command we sent it was successful or not. So the uh, the data type, the variable type is FTDI, oops, dot FT, this would help. FT status dot FT, okay, I think. What am I doing wrong here? Ah. There we go, so now I've created a new variable which is this status type and I'm starting it off with an okay status. And as we go along, we can check it and make sure everything remains okay. The last thing I'm gonna go ahead and create is a bytes written variable. A lot of times when we send data to the FTDI device, it likes to record how much data has actually been sent and it requires a special data type for that. 
So public static. Man, I keep typing status. Let's do un32. And we'll just start it with zero. All right, so now we can actually write the part of the code that interacts with the FTD, FTDI device. It's pretty short. It's going to be only four lines, and we can send serial data. So ftdi.open by index. Remember earlier we saw all of the FTDI devices start at device index zero, and they go up depending on how many devices are plugged in? That will select the first FTDI device. And then we can do um, ftdi.set baud rate. Let's do 9600 baud just to start us off. We're going to practice sending serial data. This is the most common way to use uh, a MAX-232 or a, an FTDI-232. And what data are we going to send? Hello world. And that's pretty much it. We can just send it now. FTDI.write. And then we send it the data buffer, as well as the number of bytes, and then a reference to bytes written. Did I do that all right? Yes, I did. Uh, and that's actually it. I'll probably go ahead and use this status just to be a little bit of good practice here. And we'll capture the output of each of those calls. I keep wanting to type print. I use Python a lot. Um, All right, putting a read line at the end will prevent the console window from closing when this runs. So I'll just hit F5 to run it, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, so supposedly that data got sent. Let's practice taking a look at what it actually looks like on the um, oscilloscope to make sure it's sending the type of data we think it is. Actually, let's make our jobs a little bit easier by sending this data over and over and over. So I'm just going to put an inf infinite loop here. While true, send that data. And since we never finish the program, let's just keep writing status up there. And to make it easier as well, let's add a count. So I can stick counter right there. So now if I run, I'm just going to hit F5 it'll send this data over and over. But I think that's a little bit too fast to be convenient. Let's add a delay here. Threading, thread, sleep, maybe 100 milliseconds. Or let's make it even longer, 200 milliseconds. This will send it, wait 200 milliseconds, and then repeat infinitely. So I'll hit F5, and now we can see it's sending. So I'm going to pull out the logic analyzer and we can take a look at what the signal actually looks like. OK, it's sending data continuously. So now I'm going to open up my logic analyzer software. And I think everything is set to go. I'll just hit Start. And it'll capture one second of data. And you can see these little bursts of data. That's where it's sending the serial data. So as I zoom in, you can see that one line is being pulled low. And you can even see it's decoded, H-E-L-L-O. We'll zoom in a little bit more. It says it's a comma, hello world. So this is how the serial data gets transmitted. And just to drive it home, uh, if we change the baud rate, this whole thing would be a little bit slower. The distances between these highs and lows would be greater. So this is the most common use of FTDI devices. But let's go one step deeper, and I'll show you how you can bit bang individual pins on these devices. Let's go over to the bench and hook up some LEDs so we can tell how the bit bang is working. This is an FT232R on a breakout board. And I think when I received it, I, I soldered in the header in a direction that's not really useful for me anymore, so I'm going to go ahead and remove that. Uh, I'm breaking off the old header pins and adding a little bit of solder just to make it easier for me to heat up the holes. And then I'm removing the old pins one by one. 
uh, that will leave the original holes, but they're all filled with solder. So I can use a solder sucker and heat up the reverse side of the board and suck out the solder. So I'll essentially reset this board to the way it was when I got it. Uh, you'll also notice that the side of this board has little holes that we could also put a header in. That would be cool if we wanted to insert the entire board into a breadboard and have access to additional pins. But since these five pins are the ones that are most commonly broken out on these little boards, I'm just gonna stick with the standard five at the end. So after adding that header, I can put it in a breakout board. And the first thing I always like to do is just double check that we've got power. So I always add a power LED to the VCC line. And then I'll add a bunch of individual LEDs, one for each broken out pin with a current limiting resistor and that'll get us started. Now that we've got our LEDs set up, let's modify the code to allow us to bit bang the LEDs to turn them on and off. So to make things simple, I'm just going to pretty much start over here. So this is our whole program. Uh, we can keep the open by index and the baud rate. And instead of sending a whole bunch of text as data, let's make this a byte array. And to make things simple, let's just make it a single byte. Uh, so it will be an array but it will only contain a single value. And I'll start with eight zeros. That's going to set all eight output pins to zero. And I've got uh, the names of those pins here. So if I were to set these pins to ones, I'd be setting these, <laughs> I think I said that wrong. If I were to set these bits to one, I would be setting these pins to high or five volts. If they say zero, they're going to be Ground. So let's do one more thing, I guess. FT status FTDI. We have to set bit mode. This is something that we didn't have to do before because the default mode is serial. Here, if we set the bit mode to 255 and then 1, that will allow us to bit bang these pins. 255 is a mask, and it essentially means which of these pins is an output. I could also do 0B and eight ones, that just means one, 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 they're all output. And then changing this to one means asynchronous uh, bit bang mode. If the difference between synchronous and asynchronous essentially is uh, output only or read write, but since we're only worrying about writing to the LEDs, one is perfect for us. And then we can just ftdi.write data, data length, what is that? Bytes written. And that should do it. So I'm going to go ahead and run this and see what happens. I'm going to push F5. And you can see all the lights went off. Uh, it wasn't too exciting. I guess let's go ahead and do some good practice here. All right, I'm gonna run that again, FT OK. So everything got sent correctly. Uh, let's take a closer look at those LEDs. If I were to set this very last bit to one, that will toggle the transmit pin, which will be one. So I'm gonna push F5. And sure enough, that one LED came on. The four output pins, which are easily broken out, are RX and TX, and also DTR and CTS. So if I change them all to high, you can see that all of those LEDs light up. And if, we're, if I were to make a single one go low, I can make them go low, just like that. So let's do the infamous LED blink here. And we'll do it infinitely. So while true, I guess if we're in an infinite loop, we don't need those status messages at the end. Although this one actually would be convenient. And kind of like before, so now it'll be zero and then every other number, number will be one. And there's our LED blink. One of the things that I'm going to do to make my life easier is I'm going to add some variables which help define what the actual pins are. So public static, oops, keep typing status. Um, let's make a byte just for pin 
clock. And we'll call our TX pin clock. And remember our TX pin is our very last bit, so I'm gonna set that to one. I can do the same thing for data. And select, chip select. We're not gonna worry about this one for now, but our clock signal would make sense because we want it to go from low to high continuously. And then we would want data to go high and low depending on the actual data we want to send. So let's use that as our data pin. So now, if we want to set the state, we can just do something a little bit different. <laughs> so I'm going to make my life easier and not worry about these fixed arrays. And let's just go ahead and make a list. But well, we're not going to worry about performance here. Okay, that should let us kind of send this data continuously. So let's make it so we still do the continuous loop. And I guess we lost our counter, so I'm gonna add that back. And our delay. 100 milliseconds sounds okay. All right, how many points do we want to send? Mm. I don't know. All right, what am I doing wrong? And that didn't happen either. This must be painful to watch. All right, data, add. Mm. I think we can just do that. Got to but cast it to a byte, and that should toggle between. Like uh, it'll make our clock line go up and down every time and our data line will go up and down every other time. So let's see how that does. I'm just gonna hit F5. Let's configure the logic analyzer software to capture additional channels. So we'll say we'll capture channel zero and one, let's remove the serial, and let's add, actually let's not even worry about the analyzer. I'll make that double, and we'll just hit start. So now we can see both data lines at the same time. And again, at the slow magnification, everything looks good, but when you zoom in a little bit, we would expect channel zero, which is our clock, it should be going twice as fast as channel one. Let's call it data. Yeah, so if we look really close, it actually does kind of make sense. We've got twice as many shifts on the top as we do on the bottom. So it's technically working. It just looks really, really bad. Uh, so this threw me off for a long time, I'll admit. I just thought that my software wasn't working. But later I realized that this crazy problem is actually something that's known and specific to the FT-232R. Unfortunately, the FT-232R is the most common broken out chip. So let's take this chip off and see if another FTDI chip I have has the same problem. This is an FTDI-232H and it has a few extra features, but we're just going to see what it does with the same program. And just to show you how this truly does look different on the FT-232H, I have hooked up the logic an analyzer to that board, and I'll run the same program, and we will record the data now. 
Now everything's pretty much the same, but let's zoom in. This is perfect. This is exactly what I would have expected to see on any other chip. That pin zero, or the lowest pin, is going up and down at exactly twice the frequency of that data line. So we know our code is right, and the uh, if we ever have any application where timing is really important, we know that we're going to have to use the FT232H, or pretty much anything except for the 232R. And before somebody asks, yes, I have a TTL 232R 3V3, uh, one of those embedded cables that has USB on one side and just some wires on the other side. This has the FT232R built in. It does indeed have the exact same timing problem. So this seems to be a problem consistent with all 232R chips. This is an AD9850. It's a direct digital synthesizer which can create sine waves on this output pin if we feed it the right messages of SPI. And this is actually a pretty simple SPI device. I think we send it 40 bits, which I guess is five bytes, and, um, and it'll just output a sine wave. So let's see if we can make this work. So I'm going to start by putting this in a breadboard. And by the way, I've used this little device before. It was controlled with a microcontroller, not with a computer. And I'm familiar with how to communicate with it with SPI. And also, I've gone ahead and I made a couple modifications. So one of them here is I shorted out this ground pin with this enable pin. I don't know exactly what it is. I could refer to the a schematic of the breakout board, but I think it's an enable pin where if you pull it to ground it allows it to work. Same thing here. I don't even remember what these pins are, but I shorted them to VCC or power and that was enough to help get this thing up and running with a minimum of connections. So here's our FT232R. I'm going to plug this in and set its operation for 5 volts by putting the jumper there. I'm going to stick this down in there, and that'll give me some pins that I can clamp on with my logic analyzer later. So let's go ahead and wire this up. Uh, I know just by looking at it that I can connect ground and VCC, so let's make our lives easier and go ahead and pull VCC and ground. I'm going to put ground in that ground, ground rail and put VCC up here, yeah, and then ground, I'll put it on the ground rail, and you can see it, it came alive right away. So all you have to do now is hook up our connections. So I'll grab the TX, that's going to be clock, which I know is this pin 2 here on the breakout board. And then data is coming out the RX pin, which I know goes to the second to the bottom pin over there. And then, what is that, CTS? The CTS pin goes just below the clock pin. And that should be all we need to get this device up and running. Uh, to verify the commands that are being sent, I'm going to hook up the logic analyzer again. Let's also add something that I can take a look at with the oscilloscope. So I've got an oscilloscope probe here. I'll go ahead and put that in ground. And I'll just stick a wire in there. All right, so this setup will let us take a look at the output of this DDS while we send it commands with our bit banged FT232. Let's see what the output looks like. Here's the program I made to control the AD9850. And let's have just a super quick glance at the data sheet. So this is the device. Uh, this is the data sheet for the actual chip, not the breakout board itself. But the chip shows how to program it. And pretty much, it's simple. You just give it a clock signal, a data signal. Well, I guess, yeah, I don't, I'm not even going to look too closely at the chip. I got it working. Um, and the important thing is, will send it this many bits. So it's bit from position 0 to position 9, so it's 5 bytes. And the first 4 bytes 
are frequency information, and the last few are control information. Uh, the important thing to remember is that the frequency is shifted in from the least significant bit first, so it's kind of the opposite direction that you might think of for some other things. But you send it in backwards, and then these last numbers can actually all be zero. So let's take a look at the program I did to do that. Uh, the formula to convert frequency into this frequency code is written in the data sheet, but I simplified it here. So let's, for this example, we are going to start at a certain frequency. We're going to start at 12 megahertz. So 12.345678 megahertz, or 12,345,678 hertz. Um, I'm going to comment this out here. This freak target increase was a way that I could ramp this frequency just so I could test it out. But for now, let's keep it simple. We'll lock it down to a single frequency, and we generate a code a frequency code, a really large number, by multiplying the frequency, the target frequency, by this number, which I got from the data sheet. Uh, and then we divide it by the frequency of the crystal, which is on the breakout board, and that gives us our frequency code. And then we just send our frequency code to the device using our bytes to send list. So I guess here I create a, a list of bytes, and I just add five bytes, and then I just bit bang those bytes. Uh, it is worth noting that I added a reverse bits function since it needs to be shifted in least significant bit first. It was important that I reversed all of these numbers. But aside from the bit flipping ninja magic that happens here, the rest of it is pretty simple. And I'll post this code uh, with everything else. So let's go ahead and give it a run and see how it looks on the spectrum analyzer. So remember we hooked up that spectrum analyzer, so we should be able to capture the data. There it goes, it's sending. I'll load that and hit start. And we can take a look. Sure enough, it's sending all of our values. And uh, it doesn't really matter. We don't have to look at this in detail. The part that is most interesting is going to be what it looks like on the oscilloscope. So let's run it again and see what the output is. All right, it's bang on. We set this for 12.3456 megahertz, and that's exactly what it's showing up as. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see if we can sweep this and see how smoothly it transitions from one frequency to the next. So let's give that shot. Let's give that a shot next. And just to confirm, I got it working. I set up a Yesu A57D. This is a full coverage radio receiver that I can use to detect its signal. So I'm going to turn it to 12.34, 12.34, there we go. All right, so it's about 12.346. There's a little bit of an offset because of the way I have it programmed uh, for continuous wave operation. That means it shifts the tone a little bit from where it actually is. But anyway, this is going to be a good opportunity to practice sweeping it and seeing if it changes. So I'm going to click stop here. And let's uncomment this and see what it seems, see what it does when it increases the frequency by one hertz every 20 milliseconds. There we go. and I can increase the frequency here, and when I do, it'll drop the frequency. But you can hear it's actually pretty smooth. There aren't a whole bunch of uh, clicks. So it looks like this can do a pretty clean sweep. And that concludes our video. We made a USB controlled frequency synthesizer that doesn't require a microcontroller. The USB directly bit bangs the FTDI device to control a direct digital synthesizer. But this is too cool for me just to leave it alone. I'm gonna go ahead and make an enclosure for it. So if we're gonna box something like this up, there are a couple considerations. One of them is frequency stability. If we want to have a really high precision stability on the output, we gotta do a better job thermoregulating the input. In this case, the precision of the output is a function of the precision of how stable the 125 megahertz CAN oscillator is on this board. And 
there's a quartz crystal inside of here. There's a little oscillator circuit in there. And the quartz crystal changes its resonant frequency based on temperature, among other things. So one of the best ways to improve frequency stability is to improve temperature stability. Uh, we could just wrap this whole thing in styrofoam to improve its stability, or we could get it a little bit fancier and heat it to above ambient temperature, to a very precisely controlled temperature that we can control. That's called developing a crystal oven, and those methods could improve frequency stability on the output. There's also something else we need to consider. We need to consider the quality of the power supply. Now this breakout board requires 5 volts, which right now we're just getting directly off the 5 volt rail of the USB line. USB lines are notoriously noisy. If you were to just probe the 5 volt rail, you would see there's crap all in it. So if we really cared about doing a great job from a frequency cleanliness standpoint, we'd probably want to power this from maybe a 12 volt power supply, drop it down to 5 volts with a linear regulator, and then run this on a nice smooth DC power. So with all those things in mind, we know how to build a good synthesizer. Let's just take all that off the table. Let's just get it done, make the simplest synthesizer we can, and not worry about frequency stability, power st supply stability, and all that. We'll just make it quick, dirty, and simple, and if we have a need for something complex in the future, we can go there. But for now, let's just see how much we can make with the simplest connections possible. I'm going to start out being a little bit destructive with this breakout board. So this is the AD9850 breakout board. And I don't remember if when I bought it online it came with the headers already in there, but either way, I cut them all off. I'm going to want to slide this into a small enclosure. Uh, luckily, it already had little screw holes, and I tested them with a continuity meter, and I found that they don't short with ground or a positive rail or anything like that. So I was able to screw in a little standoff, and I'll be able to drill a hole in an aluminum enclosure and then mount the little DDS device on the standoff. Um, now I'm using a little beveler, which is great for beveling screw holes. And by the way, one of the reasons I'm just going to use a single screw to mount this instead of a bunch is I'm kind of on the fence on whether I should try at all to improve thermal stability of this device. Technically, if I wanted to get a little more inspired and try to thermoregulate that crystal, there's enough space all around it that I could cover it in styrofoam or maybe some type of, I don't know, <laughs> any type of material. Uh, I don't know what it's called, but there's that spray foam that people in plumbing spray between pipes and it expands and seals and thermo insulates and stuff like that. Uh, anyway, I go through kind of assembling the package and in this case I can mark off where my breakout board's going to be. And you probably saw I glued it to the enclosure, not with super glue or anything, I just used a whole bunch of hot glue. I found that sticking to aluminum, it kind of does the job. So now I can use a nibbler to cut out a square hole just the right size for that USB port and when I screw on the back cover, the USB port looks pretty good, even though inside there's just a whole bunch of hot glue. Uh, that's one of those things I'm a little bit embarrassed about. If I ever make a really nice product or send something to a client, I try to minimize how much hot glue I use in it. If I use a little bit, I don't mind doing it just to help stability of wires or something like that, but I don't try to use it for actual structural purposes. But for that, with that being said, it's, you know, it's effective at holding things, things into place sometimes. And this little test device is not going to be dropped off an airplane. I'm just going to keep it on my workbench. So now I'm going to measure out and tap a few impressions in my front panel. Again, use the beveler so I get nice smooth holes. And I can start mounting in a bezel for a 3 millimeter blue LED that will be a power LED, and then also a BNC connector. I kind of went back and forth as to whether or not I should use an SMA connector. I'm going more and more toward using little SMA cables and SMA jumpers when I build my personal projects. But just for tradition, I'm using a BNC connector here. Uh, it's also a little bit convenient because I can just wire a cable straight from this device to my oscilloscope, maybe even terminating in a 50 ohm load or something. So, um, you know, it's kind of a toss up BNC or SMA, but either way, the output's looking great. So I can screw that together. And now we have all the components in the board. All we have to do is wire them together and then we should be good to go. Again, I just got to mention how, how entertaining this project is for me. I'm making a computer controlled frequency generator and I'm not using a microcontroller. I've made devices like this before, even using the AD9850 or whatever it is, but every time there's been a whole lot of work programming a microcontroller to interface with the computer. This is the first time I've ever made 
a device like this that just goes straight from a FTTI device to a SPI device. So there's the final product. We have our output BNC and our power LED and a USB port. Couldn't be simpler. Once you close it up, you won't even be able to tell that there's a whole bunch of hot glue in there. Uh, I wasn't entirely satisfied with how wobbly those little wires were, so I'm going to add a second round of hot glue just to hold everything in place. And once it's sealed up, you won't be able to see that glue. It'll feel solid, and it looks pretty good. Uh, these little aluminum enclosures, I think I got those on Amazon, but they're all over Amazon and eBay. They're not too expensive. And this looks great. Uh, there's only one more thing I'm going to do that, to me, really makes a difference, and that's making little labels for these devices. I found that if I use clear label tape and then I add a black border on the edge, it makes a label that looks really nice. That black border on the edge helps prevent your eyes from noticing the fact that the background isn't entirely clear, it's mostly clear. And without that label, it's, or without the black line, black box, it's a little more obvious that it's a label. So I try really hard to get these things lined up. And if it's a really long label like this, I can do a pretty good job just by getting the center of it stuck first and then rubbing it out on the sides. Smaller labels like these, I love to use a little razor blade, the end of an X-Acto knife. And that way I can get it extremely precise. There's nothing more frustrating than putting on a label and realizing it's one or two degrees tilted from level. Uh, so at the very end, I'm gonna put some rubber feet on to prevent wobbling due to that one screw in the middle, but also just to make it look and feel a little bit nicer, make it grip the counter. And with that, I think we're pretty much done. We've got a great command line controlled USB arbitrary radio frequency synthesizer. And I can see this thing being a core piece of instrumentation that I have on my bench perhaps for years to come. So I'm really happy I made this. This came out really great and I couldn't be more pleased with how simple it is and how easy it is to use. Overall, I'm really happy with the way this project came out today, and I'm super impressed with how good that final enclosure looks. I always forget how good clear labels look when they're put on nice aluminum enclosures, so I've got to remember to use that for more projects in the future. In fact, I've already started working on my next project, and it bit bangs FTDI, or it uses FTDI to bit bang seven segment display drivers, and keep an eye out for that. And if you're interested in learning more about using C Sharp to program FTDI devices, or if you just want to replicate some of what you saw today, all of the code examples are on my GitHub page and on my website, and the links are in the description below. And full links for resources for this project and a lot of other projects like it can be found on my website, and that's swharden.com.